olden days, there used to be many, many, many newspapers in print. These are some of them. And now we're down to John's paper, the Daily Journal, the Daily Post, when you can find it, and of course the Burlingame Bee, um, that is sort of depending on the time, yes? You forgot a very important one. I'm sorry, the voice. A Burlingame voice. But that, and that was paper for about, it was paper for about eight years. Yes. And then it turned digital. I'm not talking about digital. Um, I want to focus on the Burlingame Advance newspaper. The Burlingame Advance newspaper and Advance Star existed for about 70 years. They were in five locations in Burlingame. They began um, over on East Lane near that the old laundry that was there that was torn down at some point next to Rubles. Um, there was a real printing press there. Then they moved to Burlingame Avenue. Then they moved every time there was a commercial renewal of some sort. They got bounced around, like maybe that happens with newspapers. Um, they were on Lorton. Then they were in the Bank of Burlingame. Then they were, they ended up back on Lorton, which was their long time location from the 20s to the 60s. And their long time publisher was George McQueen, big name around in Burlingame. Mike McQueen was the son, um, and he was big time uh, alum, no, is that the right word? Alumnus, alum, um, of Burlingame High School. And he passed away a few years ago. Uh, from him, we have, um, some materials I just want to share. Uh, this is the crew of the 1940s staff, and you're going to see the building on Lorton, which I don't know what it is now. It's turning into a new bakery, I believe. But it went, it's a restaurant on one side called Salt Yard, and it goes through to the back, and um, the, the whole, the whole paper and press and everything, offices were in this large building for all these years. And so these people, the staff, are standing, I think, on the back side, because I can see the Frank Hart Grove behind them. I can see the donut shop area. Um, so it's kind of cute. It's kind of cool to be newspaper staff, right? And then here's the inside the building. All this <coughs> machinery and such. This is the back side, which kind of now all blocked off, but the building's still there on the California Drive side. Uh, this is uh, on Lorton in the, in the, on the Lorton side. It, it's showing a bunch of kids, I think, being recruited to be carriers with their bikes. And then I have a um, very nice account, uh, of which I'm going to read a little bit, of an early carrier, because that maybe some of the folks around here new carriers or work carriers growing up. And while I'm reading that, I'm just going to show you what it looked like with the flag, 310. Some of you may remember that, 1966, the wonderful old shot. Well, there we go. So if you excuse me, I'm just really briefly when I read this. Okay, this is from James McKay. I think it was approximately, can you hear me? That is, she just brought, she brought the mic in. Well, I'd rather not, if you can hear me, I'd rather not. Hi. Okay. I think it was approximately 1937. I'd be 13 years old and in the eighth grade. A postcard arrived at home telling me that a paper route had opened up and I should come to the Burlingame Advanced Star office to talk to the circulation manager. The newspaper expected the papers to be delivered, this is the evening papers, to be delivered on porches before 7 p.m. each day. Massey explained to me how the carriers were paid, and catch this one. It was pretty straightforward. I collect the subscription money from the customers each month, and the newspaper billed me for the papers I'd been given. After I paid my paper bill, the remaining money was mine to keep. Mr. Massey stressed how important it was to report any drops promptly and important to add new subscribers to replace the old ones. He walked me through the newspaper building in the back room, showing me where the paper boys assemble, and he told me to come to that rear door the next afternoon at 4 p.m. The building was the size of one square city block, and I believe he's talking about this one, which lasted a long time. So the front and the rear entrances were on different streets. The front was on Lord, the rear on California. It looked as if hundreds of people worked there. Everybody was very busy. 
The Advanced Star was the afternoon paper that came out six days a week. No Sunday deliveries. There were no fringe benefits to the job. There were no deductions from the collections I received. I was responsible to maintain my bike in working condition. If my bike wasn't working, I would have to walk my route to deliver the papers. These details didn't bother me at all. I was delighted to be able to give up my current two jobs, which were magazine sales and the San Francisco newspaper sales at the Broadway train station. When I got home, I told my mother that I had landed the job and repeated to her what Mr. Massey had told me. She was pleased that the route was in our very own neighborhood, where I knew the streets and where many of the residents knew who I was, and, and the expected additional cash would be a real help with our monthly needs. My dad had passed away four, four years earlier, and my mom was working several part-time jobs just to make ends meet. Are you with that? This is 1937. The next afternoon, this is now a second day of work, I arrived at the back door of the paper and entered the assembly room. <clears throat> there were about 25 carriers all talking at once, laughing and just plain horsing around. Well, everyone waited, waited to hear who I was and who I was replacing. Finally, there was a rumbling sound that's growing louder and louder from the next room. The press had begun running the papers and they were running into our room on the conveyor belt, slowly at first, then faster and faster. The supervisor, Mr. Code, handed the papers in batches of 50 to the out-of-town carriers first. Every 50th paper was slightly askew, so it's easy to keep count of how many were being handed out. John logged how many papers he gave to each carrier, and they left right away. They drove to the beginnings of their, of their routes before they folded their papers to deliver them. The rest of us waited until Goad called our route number. It was essential to know your number. After he gave you your newspapers and you logged the number, you took the papers to one of the metal top tables and began to box and fold them. The guy I'm replacing, I heard, boxes them smoothly and slowly. <clears throat> I'm shown how to do it, but I was a klutz at first. My mentor also showed me how to stack them in the cardboard box. He has he has in his bike basket. Explain to me how important it is that the papers be folded correctly and inserted in the box properly so that you can pull them out quickly and throw without needing to look. If you grab a folded paper at the proper corner, it would fly intact and not come apart. So obviously no rubber, no rubber bands were used and no baggies. So it was, it was time well spent to box the papers tightly and you pack them in your box with the proper corner facing you, and it made the delivery a whole lot smoother. Often the paper came in two or three sections. It must be inserted within each other before starting to box them. If the weather looked like rain, you had to grab a bunch of wax papers and use them as protective cover. You placed a piece of wax paper on each newspaper before boxing them, folding everything together at once. This process of inserting sections is called stuffing. I learned, I soon learned that the carriers would have contests to see who was the fastest stuffer and the fastest boxer. Carl Schwann was undoubtedly the fastest stuffer. He achieved 3,000 papers per hour. Bob Burnham was the fastest boxer, but I can't recall how many papers he did per minute. We measured boxing in papers per minute and stuffing in papers per hour. It took about one and a half hours for the press to run, run to be completed. Most of the carriers had already left for their routes, and the last ones to get their papers from Mr. Code were still boxing and packing them. Code was also responsible for rolling about 200 papers. Individually, they had to be mailed to subscribers in other cities and states. He had, his, he had a stack of 8 by 11 blank newsprint sheets with the name and mailing address stamped on each one, and he did about 20 papers at a time, spreading out the wrappers, applying a line of glue to one end, and rolling the, paper, the newspapers in them one at a time. He loaded all of them into his car to take the post office and also took bundles of newspapers to fill the many newsstands in downtown Burlington. So uh, he goes on to say later after the fact that he it helped pay for his college education, which um, is like amazing to me. So I just wanted to uh, mention this was a really important component in those days of running a business, running a newspaper business. So um, I'm going to hand it over 
to John, our speaker, and we're so grateful to have you today. I can also be able to give you a real speaker. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for having me today. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Good to see some familiar faces. Remember when I was a young guy? Yeah. <laughs> that was a while ago. Um, and Russ, I'm interested in learning more about this exhibit. Uh, it seems like it could be kind of interesting. Um, so, what, so I'm supposed to talk about the history of newspapers, right? So I'm going to start at 1440 and go year by year. <laughs> it's going to take maybe four or five hours or so. Um, but I, I think there's something going on later today. Right? So, um, maybe I'll just fast forward to this part. Um, so I, I have this. This is the history of newspapers. And it's not a complete history. It's just what I have. And I'll share it with you. I got this because there was a kid named Paul who emailed me uh, desperate and said, um, I'm doing a capstone project. I had no idea what this was. Um, and uh, the deadline for picking an advisor for my capstone project is today. And it's on communication, and um, can you can you help me? And I said, well, yes, I will, because if you have no other options, and otherwise you're not going to do it. Um, and uh, and uh, I said, well, what do you what do you want to do? And he said, I have no idea. So I said, well, why don't you? Um, and he had no journalism. He wasn't on the school paper. Nothing, right? Super shy guy too. Um, so I said, well, why don't you do uh, find the history of newspapers in San Mateo County? That's his capstone project. So anyway, that's how I got this, and I kept it um, on a file, and I never knew who I would tell them about this, but I guess this seems appropriate. So I'll read it. This is the boring part, by the way. And then after this, I'm done with this, it'll be very exciting. So just, <laughs> just, just bear with me during the less exciting part. But you might find this more exciting. I don't know. Um, so the San Mateo Gazette first appeared in Road City in 1859. Um, that was the very first newspaper in San Mateo County. In 1876, the name was changed to the Times Gazette. Uh, the People's Journal was it started in March 1877 in Road City, and it was discontinued the following May. So, <laughs> so you know, when you see when you talk about you know, websites and things that don't last, I mean, it's, it's, there's a history to this. People just give it a try. I mean, that's that. Um, so the Democrat came out in October 1886. It was the Times Gazette's um, first real rival. And the Democrat produced a daily paper called The Star, which was published from the Democrat office by uh, James Hedge and Edward McGettigan. It only lasted one year. The Democrat was later bought by Arthur Swift and James D. Hedge and had his name changed to The Standard. Uh, the Daily Tribune started in uh, Road City 1925. Um, they were by D. E. Wood and George Morrill. They were also the editors of the College of Times, which ran, which was running in connection with the Tribune. I don't know exactly when that ended, but I know it lasted pretty long. The Times Tribune out of the Roman City. Uh, the first newspaper in the city of San Mateo was the San Mateo Leader in 1889, and then there was a newspaper called the News, original. Um, in the growing town of South San Francisco in 1891. It's the first paper to appear in North County. Um, let's see. In 1898, um, the Happen Bay Review was founded. So that's actually the longest running newspaper in the county. Um, and then San Mateo gained its second paper, the San Mateo Times, in 1901. Um, and it Let's see, in 1919, it passed ownership to Horace Amplett, if you guys are familiar with Amplett Boulevard, um, which is interesting because that's where our newspaper is on today. Um, and then in uh, 1925, Amplett made it a full-fledged shopping daily, and then infused with the uh, San Mateo Leader in 1926. Uh, the Daily City Record came into existence in 1905, and then I have a section here about the Burlingame Advance, um, which became the Advance Star. So okay, it's a little bit more, and I'll read the whole thing, so I thought it might be interesting. Um, in 1906, the paper that would become the Advance Star began as the Burlingame Advanced. 
It was owned initially by the Burlingame Publishing Company. The first edition was a six-column, four-page tabloid-sized paper that was released in April 1906. The paper started in its first edition that reforms are brought about mainly through agitation, and we, the advance, warn our leaders that we intend to agitate. So, cool move, right? In 1910, the paper came under the ownership of Sandy Merck. Merck served as the sole owner and editor of the paper. Under his leadership, uh, the paper made great advancements like using photos, doubling its new space by increasing its page count to six. Um, it also became a semi-weekly semi paper in 1923. And then Merck is also credited with the successful merger of the Advance and the Burlingame Star into the Advance Star. In December 1936, the paper was sold to Peninsula Newspapers, Inc. And then I think you guys actually have more history in this part. Um, and then in 1970, it closed a uh, victim of fiscal troubles. Um, let's see. And then in 1965, the Foster City Progress was founded by uh, T. Jack Foster, whose family developed Foster City. Uh, Foster City Islander was created by Sam Felzer in 1973. Uh, it shut down when he died, and then Mark Watson and his brother, I can't remember his name, uh, run it now. It's a, a monthly or weekly or something like that. Um, and then in 1996, the San Mateo Times was sold to the Alameda Newspaper Group and renamed the San Mateo County Times. And then... Um, before it ceased to exist in April, on April 5th, 2016, the County Times was identical to the San Jose Mercury News for three years prior. So when you got the Mercury, when you got the County Times, it was the exact same paper as the, the Mercury News. Um, in the meantime, in 1993, the Fang family brought a series of weeklies owned by Fuchs Publications, which included the Millbury Sun, the Burlingham Millsboro Boutique and Villager, the San Jose Weekly, the Red City Tribune, and the San Carlos Inquirer Bulletin. Uh, it was rebranded as Independent in 1998. Um, interesting that I don't really know how all of those publications started. Uh, so maybe at some point I'll fill that in. Uh, but I know that they were independent weeklies and then they all sort of came under Jerry Fuchs. But I, don't, I never asked that, that question. So there's a hole in that. Um, anyway, so it was rebranded as Independent in 1998, dissolved and merged with the Examiner, which the Fang family bought from Hearst for a dollar. And a $75 million subsidy. It was sold to Bill Anschutz in 2004, then sold again in 2011, then 2014, then again in 2020 to Clint Riley, who originally sued Hertz to keep the city a newspaper town, a two newspaper town, which forced to sell to the Fang family. So Clint finally got his paper. Uh, I don't know, does it still come around here? Do you guys see the yeah. examiner yeah. um, And then in 2000, the Daily Journal, that's, that's my paper. Uh, was launched the same week as the Daily News, the Redwood City Daily News, the Burlingame Daily News. All three of the Daily News were identical, aside from the localized lead headline. Uh, this first week was actually a joint effort with our staff providing content for the Daily News, uh, which was an offset of the Palo Alto Daily News. Uh, but then after the first week, the staff separated. So this is before I got there. Um, they tried to make it work, and then there was a big difference of opinion, which I'm not really sure what that is. Um, and then we originally focused solely on San Mateo and Burlingame and then expanded from South City to Redwood City. And then the Daily News ceased publication in 2009, four years after it sold to Night Ritter, the Palo Daily Post, started by the original owners of the Daily News, launched in 2008 after a three-year non-compete agreement. And then we celebrated our 22nd anniversary in August. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the history. Um, so... I'll talk a little bit about myself, right? Because that's why I'm here to talk about me, right? Um, so, and how did I get into newspapers? And, and I think I've told this story like three times or so, but basically it started with, um, so my grandmother was a newspaper editor in the Central Valley, um, in Lodi, and uh, she was the managing editor of the Lodi Sentinel, she was the first female um, managing editor of the Sentinel. And, um, but at the time, she was working for a different publication after, after retiring from there. Um, my grandparents founded a newspaper in Lodi, the Lodi Life and Times, which went out of business. Um, and then she was working for the Lockwood Clements News, which was owned by my aunt. And so when I was six years old, um, she would still contribute uh, stories um, and uh, edit stories and all that. And so she would go into her office and she would 
type on a manual typewriter and she smoked Marlboro Reds. And so she had the cigarette smoke was going everywhere. She'd slam the carriage, she types like so fast. I've never seen anyone type so fast. So here I am six, and I'm thinking this seems very exciting, right? This, this type, typing seems very exciting. So I wanted to type for a living. And so uh, that's sort of where it started. And, and there's more to it than that is that um, you know, she, I would go to the store with her, you know, she needed a block of cheese or something like that. And it would take forever because she would go to the store and she would see farmers and she'd see people and they'd say, oh, I need your help. I, I have a, a situation and she'd, you know, figure out, well, call me on Monday and I'll see what I can do. Um, someone had a story idea, we should look into this and that kind of thing. And she was sort of a connector, right? And, um, and, I, and I recognized at that point that that's a pretty important job, right? To be able to connect people within our community and to hold people to account when necessary. And so that kind of appealed to me um, at an early age. And so I just felt like I should do something like that. Um, and so I did it. And so when I was in eighth grade, I uh, founded a newspaper at my school. And I was kind of a one man, uh, one boy show. Um, and uh, you know, it was, I did it once a month. It was two pages. And I had a horoscope. And I had a feature on as a student and teacher and that kind of thing. And then in high school, I got into the high school journalism. Um, in college, I started a, a magazine, um, so I'm Gen X, and it was basically just to sort of talk about serious issues for Generation X because all the publications at that point were all music and fashion and entertainment lifestyle, and I felt like there were other things that were more important. Um, and then came out here, and um, when I came out here, so I'm originally from California, I moved to Florida for high school and college. Um, and then moved back over here. And uh, started working at what was the San Rafael News Pointer, which was a weekly, I did that for five months. And then got a job at the independent newspaper group um, as the editor of the San Mateo Weekly. Um, you know, and I didn't have that much experience and I was the editor of this newspaper, but it, I made it work. Um, and then I worked there for three years and then when the Daily Journal started, I thought, well, that seems pretty neat because I always wanted to do a, uh, work for a daily newspaper. And so um, I started working. The Daily Journal started in August 2000, and I started in October 2000. So everyone always asks, did you start it? And I said, well, no, but pretty close. Um, so that's sort of uh, where we are. And, and I guess what enabled us to start is sort of what people talk about as the, the death of the local newspaper. And that's really the internet, right? So there's Craigslist, there's Facebook, there's Google. Craigslist was a huge hit, huge hit to newspapers because that's all the classifieds. And that was usually like 25% of the revenue. You know this constant, right? Of course. Yeah. Um, so when you take that away, all of a sudden there's cuts. And as soon as you start cutting, then there's more cuts. And then the, the quality of the news goes down, the quality of the stories go down, the ability to cover things goes down, and people lose interest. And then it's sort of a death spiral. And um, so, uh, and then, Google and Facebook also suck a lot of ads from, from uh, newspapers as well. Um, so, but the, the, the internet and also desktop, desktop publishing allowed us to um, create a newspaper with a smaller staff. So, you know, when you have the pictures of the press and everything and the huge staffs and everything, you, we don't need that anymore. You can do it with a computer, we send it to the press, it's, you can do it with a much smaller staff. And so that enabled us to begin. And so we were able to, to sort of um, kind of edge our way in at the end of this era uh, into this new era. And at the time, it was very it was supposed to be this very innovative thing. And we're supposed to replicate this all over the country, these little microdatas all over the country. And of course, that didn't happen, right? So, um, and now you'll see that all the news is, is moving, migrating to online. Um, but that doesn't mean newspapers or news agencies are dying. It just means that, um, that uh, the newspaper itself is probably kind of at its end of its life. Um, so to me, you know, when I talk when I talk about this long list of newspapers, and you know, we talk about the history of newspapers, and and you know, and we're at the end of this, right? And uh, but I also feel like we're kind of at the beginning, like we're the first uh, news site website. Uh, so we're maybe the last newspaper, but then we're also the first website. Um, and I think that would be kind of an interesting thing. And if you really think about the history of, of our society, 
is that you know human beings are only 250,000 years old or so, right? And so if you're talking about the printing press in 1440, that's about 600 years. And if you're talking about, you know, you know when was Berlin incorporated? I'm sure someone knows. 1908. 1908. 1908. <laughs> 1908. Of I mean, this city is really uh, relatively young, right? And so, you know, we're moving into this new era. Uh, so 600 years of printing, and then we're at the very beginning of this. And so maybe in 100 or 200 years from now, someone will have a similar discussion talking about the history of online newspapers too, uh, or online media. And so I think that's kind of an interesting thing. It's, you know, newspapers always talk about like, sort of the death, our, our own death, our own demise, right? And we're really good at talking about our own demise, you know? Like, oh, it's so what was us, you know? It's, it's real tough. And then everyone's like, well, you know, and so people say, well, what's going on with you? Are you guys making it, you know? And yeah, of course we're making it. Um, but, you know, I, I think that you just have to sort of be creative and move with the times. I mean, like, no one really cried about the town crier going out of business when Gutenberg invented the printing press, right? I mean, maybe they did. Maybe the town crier was like, well, what are going to do? Um, <laughs> anyway, so um, I guess the topic is how is news made, right? So um, how do we do it? Um, so. I mean, it's a 20-hour, I think I covered this a little bit in the podcast with Mark, is a 20-hour operation. There's a lot of email, a lot of talking, a lot of uh, reaching out to people. But mainly, like, the bread and butter is covering city government, right? Because city government, um, if we didn't cover it, no one else would really cover it. And that's where sort of decisions are made that affects everyone. And so we cover, you know, local news in that, in that respect. Um, 20 years ago, there was a ton more community-based coverage, you know, we would cover crab feeds, we would cover, you know, the rotary meetings and all that kind of stuff. But as everyone here knows, times change and times are changing around here. And where it used to be more time would be spent on community-based, you know, features and that kind of thing, now it's mainly political controversy, right? Land use is a big, uh, is a big uh, topic. You know, what is the future? How do we balance the, the past and the, what makes a place good with, what, what, you know, with making room for, for new people? And so that's sort of the conflict. Um, and that's grown to the point where we don't necessarily have time to uh, get to all those crab feed stuff. And so I feel like that's kind of, it's kind of sad for me a little bit because I, I enjoy that. I feel like that's, there is a role for a community newspaper in that um, to reflect the activities of people who are engaged and active in the community. Um, so that's sort of a, a loss. Um, but if you want to, you know, and, and I guess another thing too is that, you know, people say there's less crime now or there's more crime now, depending on your perspective. But say if we were to see six to eight cop cars on Burlingame Avenue, we may not cover that um, because a strong arm robbery isn't news anymore because it happens all the time, right? So it, there's a perception that there's less there's less crime, but actually there's more crime. We're more accustomed to it, right? And we don't have the resources because we're a small operation to go to every strong arm robbery. Um, and so that's sort of if we focus more and if we're more community based, of course, a strong arm robbery would have been big news. Um, but that's not the case anymore. It has to be big, big news. And and we go to share big news. We just had seven people murdered on the coast a couple weeks ago. Um, and so, you know, and we had the flooding, we had COVID, you know, uh, we had a pretty uh, substantial election cycle that we had to cover pretty intensely. So our hands are full doing a lot of different things and we're doing our best to keep our roots of being a community based while also recognizing that times change as well. So, um, and what's interesting too, you know, talking about online versus, um, versus print, you know, you know, Russ, you mentioned that you, Nextdoor, right? Nextdoor is a big, big thing. People get a lot of their information from Nextdoor. Um, I'll tell you a story about Nextdoor, which is kind of funny, is that, um, well, first, well, no, I'll just tell this one. Um, <laughs> so there was a, um, some controversy that, I can't remember exactly what it was, but we wrote a story about it. Someone posted on Nextdoor. There's a big, long string of conversation about this. And then um, with people saying that um, you're wrong and no, you're wrong and I'm right and you're right and how dare you say that, that I'm wrong when you're wrong and all this kind of thing. And then someone you know, says, well, we should do this, called ARMS, 
And then I don't like you because of your politics. And why bring politics into all this, right? <laughs> so this is the whole string of it, right? It's it, because someone did pick up the dog poop on someone's front lawn. Yeah, it could it's be. Yeah. 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 Camera. I don't think it was the dog poop, but it was based on a story we had already, yeah, but those are good. Um, but it was based on the story we had written, right? So someone posted our story in this whole yeah. conversation. At the end of it, someone actually emailed me and said, there was this discussion on Nextdoor. You should really do a story about it. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, no, we did. That was the whole thing. That's the whole thing. So, yeah, but there's more going on here. And I, and, and I don't know if there's anything else going on. So, so Nextdoor is a good source of information, but also a good source of misinformation, too. Um, but it is interesting how people use it. And um, you know, I think what and will ultimately end up happening and is that um, there will be more websites coming on that will focus on local news. Everyone is interested in local news. And I think that what may end up happening is that, and you see this like there's medium posts uh, in which people um, will give $5 a month to hear, to, to read their you know, weekly post on whatever it is, housing, you know, if they agree with them or whatever. And so I think more of that will emerge. And I think that right now we're sort of this, in this atomization of, of news and, um, and how people receive it and how people uh, want it and understand it. And, it um, and I could see that in the future that you'll have more sites and people will uh, uh, be more interested in different sites. And, and that you'll be able to actually pay a reporter to do some stories. Um, I think you'll see a, an emergence of that, and maybe what will happen is that it'll just end up being like a newspaper, is that they'll get going with it, and then they'll take heat if they have a bias, and then they'll say, well, maybe I should tell both sides, and then all of a sudden they're doing responsible journalism. Um, and I kind of see that as sort of the next evolution. But um, um, also people talk about sort of the, the heyday of journalism, right? Like everyone talks about Watergate. You know, what, you know why, why are you doing like uh, investigative reporting like Watergate? Yeah. And uh, and you know the thing is is that like if you remember back in in San Francisco there's the San Francisco Call the Bulletin uh, the Examiner the Chronicle and I think a couple other ones and everyone all of those had their own sort of takes on things and so if you were a union guy you would you would read that one um, if you were a business guy you would read the other one um, and I kind of feel like that's sort of what we're um, we're sort of getting into a little bit. Um, but, you know, I don't know um, if it was ever all that like, amazing. I mean, people talk about, I mean, there's always good journalism going on, but there's also bad journalism going on. That's been the case from, from the beginning of, of uh, the printing press. And so, um, you know, does anyone know when, does, it, does it, anyone like the, the movie Vertigo? Vertigo? Oh, yes. Yeah, everyone yeah, likes Vertigo, right? Different. It's an interesting movie. It, does anyone know what year it came out? 50 something. 58, right? All right, so, so you think 58 must have been a really good year for movies, right? Because Vertigo came out. Um, but the attack of the 50 foot woman also came out. In <laughs> so it's not like. It was a good year. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> depends on how you look at it. Right? Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of that, you know, everyone says like Watergate is like the big thing. But, like, I don't, I don't know if, if it was all, ever all that good. So. Um, there's good and bad in, in everything, right? And so you just have to pick and choose. And, and from my perspective, it's sort of, you know, back to the point about, um, you know, supporting reporters or whatever, um, you know, there's a way that you can, you support what you value, right? So people support us through subscribing or taking out ads and all that. And, um, or just even reaching out to us with story ideas. Um, also just keeping tuned, like, did you hear this? You know, people always say, like, why weren't you there? And I'm like, well, we didn't know. <laughs> but if, did you hear this? That's a better way of sort of like getting us to go. Um, so, I mean, that's just sort of the way if you want to, if you like the Daily Journal and you like the community news, then just, you know, find different ways to support us, and that's basically it. So, um, I, that's all I have as far as um, my statements. And uh, I guess I'll take questions if anyone has them. Yeah, go ahead. Do people call you when something's in progress to alert you to it? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Are you listening to police scanners? Or? We do. Yeah, we have a scanner in the office that I listen to. Um, and I've gotten pretty good at like, picking up on um, what's going on overall. Um, it was interesting, though, because we were in the Russian River uh, when the fires happened. What was that, two years ago? Yeah. 
two years ago. And so I was, so my instinct is to listen to the scanner to pick up on it. And I was lost. I was like, I can't, I can't really pick up on it. You know, I can't really understand sort of like the energy of the voices or anything, whereas like I can pick that up around here. Like I know when something is urgent or not urgent based on how people say things, not necessarily what they say. So it's kind of like a weird skill to have. Did you, you have a question? Yeah. Part of our issues as historians is, is information disappearing. Mm -hmm. And everyone says, well, it's in the internet, it'll be there forever. Not necessarily true. And so, what happens to all of your content? Is it something that is something to the public? Is it private? What happens to all of your past that you've done? Right, so we have um, copies of everything, right? And we have electronic copies. We actually lost about two years of our archives. Um, but some other website picked up our stories at that point, so we're replenishing them. And then we also have the hard copy that we're working on um, replenishing as well. But I know the Historical um, Museum in, in uh, Redwood City and then the San Mateo Library has every edition that we've ever done. So that's one way. So I mean, like, and I'm sure someone has papers around. But um, I mean, we plan to have um, our site up for a while. But yeah, there's a chance that it could disappear at some point. Um, and, then, yeah, and, and then what do you do? What do you do? Right. But I mean, I think as far as doing historical research, I think having it online is, is I mean, we're reaching the point where the Daily Journal's been, 20, been around for 22 years. And if you go back to like 2004, it certainly feels like history. You know, it feels like the time, you know? um, so I think having that ability to, on, like, from your house, just go in and, and just check out something um, is pretty good overall for doing research. So do you see the future of, of any type of publication to be first transient because people read? Mm -hmm. And new caretakers come in if they mm -hmm. are caretakers, or are they, right. or are they buyers of, of data? Yeah. And so, what right. are you seeing? Like there was a whole bunch of stuff, and right when the internet started, world, mm -hmm. we had a whole consolidation of information. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was all bought up. Mm -hmm. And so, you see the same thing happening with respect to newspapers. I know we buy some of our stuff. We bought from some source mm -hmm. that had gotten all of the information, the visual mm -hmm. stuff, and mm -hmm. use that in order to do research. Mm -hmm. I mean, but what happens to, what, if that goes away? Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's like the whole idea of a, a business, a local business, right? Um, when the proprietor dies and the children don't want to take care of it, then it can be sold or it can go away. And sometimes if it's sold, or even if the child takes over, um, I'm not suggesting it. <laughs> um, um, you know, it's going to be different, right? Um, so there is a chance that you do lose something when, you know, over time, that's what happens, right? Um, but I think that there's more um, information out there than there's ever been. And I don't see it necessarily as a stressor that we're going to lose things. I think that there are multiple ways that people can access this information. Well, well there's time. information, and then there's information that's actually um, Research that's that's mm -hmm. more qualified. Mm -hmm. It's more something that you can trust than mm -hmm. opposed to something you throw on the internet. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean that's the whole challenge is trying to find trusted sources of information on the internet, right? I mean that's we're all struggling with that. Um, but I think that there's probably an opportunity over time that we'll figure that out. Um, but there are instances I think where some things will be lost. But we're doing our best to make sure that our archives are pretty solid overall. Um, and I don't really see anyone buying it from us. Um, but if that happens, I would be sure to um, make sure someone gets it, um, or at least a copy of it. Um, we do give some of our old photos um, to the Redwood City History Museum. Um, just when we know, just for, we, we store them, and we used to store them on CDs, and it's just too much for us to kind of keep. Because we have two, we have, photos that we printed and photos that we took. And so, you know, we'll take 35 photos and we'll run one. So all those 35 photos, we don't necessarily need them, but there might be something useful, so we'll just think here. Oh yeah, because I had That's a deal with the Milan family that had all the glass. Mm -hmm. Right. And they had literally 100,000 
because it was started like in 1900. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the issue, logging it in and documenting right. yeah. it and doing that. Yeah. 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 Uh, John, I'm just curious. A lot of industries today we hear are having trouble finding employees and retaining employees. So I'm curious about your organization and particularly young reporters. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, we had a pretty mm -hmm. solid staff for 15 years, and then it started sort of turning over um, just because of the cost of living. Wow. And um, yeah, I mean, we don't pay that much, um, but um, you know, we pay okay. Um, but it's real hard to make ends meet, especially if you have student debt, uh, college debt, that kind of thing. Um, so it is a challenge in all industries around here. Um, I was talking to, I was getting a, a, a jacket tailor. I was talking to the tailor and he's like, yeah, I'm, I, I have to work this weekend because I can't get anyone to, to work here. I can't find anyone. So that's a, that's a big problem across all industries around here. Yeah. 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 Uh, regarding crime reporting, um, are police departments as transparent as they used to be? Because mm -hmm. I was a daily newspaper reporter in the 1970s okay. in Ohio. I used to get up real early in the morning, go to the police station. They had a clipboard with all the police reports, all the crime mm -hmm. that happened over the previous you know, 24 hours. I go through and mm -hmm. take notes and then write up, go back to the office and write up the ones that were Interesting. important. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, I, I could talk to the detective or... Are you interested in doing any volunteer? <laughs> 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 that was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was like a daily thing. Yeah. And, you know, the police were pretty cooperative. I get pretty lot of detail mm -hmm. on... I, I didn't print it all, like victims' names, sometimes mm -hmm. rape victims, etc. Mm -hmm. But it was all there in the police report. And I was talking to someone recently, and they said, well, police farmers don't do that anymore. You right. just get some real sketchy thing and that you don't you don't hardly get any details at all. Yeah. So I mean that is true. There was it used to I used to, when we first started I would drive to the uh, Burlington Police Department and sit there for a couple hours, you know, with the clipboard as you described. And we would go to all the different ones, right? And um, but the problem is is that there as we expanded our coverage area and you know it would be so great to have someone like you on our staff that would do that. <laughs> um, but there's so many different things to cover that we just don't do that. So um, we get it. We get it um, by email. We get they send over the police reports by email, or we access them online. They post them online, and there's not that much information there. There's the essentials, right? But if there is something of interest, dead body found in a trunk, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> um, which hasn't been the case, right? Um, I actually found that after someone typed it in, and I said, don't you think that would be something that you should bring up? He said, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, so we'll ask questions, we'll call and ask questions, and uh, it turned out that it wasn't a dead body in the trunk, but it was suspicious, suspicion of dead body. Uh, but, um, so we'll call and ask questions, and then there, you, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, and it depends on the PIO you get, um, We'll just fill us in on the details of it. But um, as far as being able to go through all, all the police reports, then there was this whole thing. There's a, there's a few new laws that they have to redact all identifying information. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, it used to be that they just trusted us, right? Yeah. And then not anymore because someone somewhere burned them, right? Or someone burned someone. And so now they have to go through and redact. So, you know, they're less open to that. So that's sort of another issue. So. Good. Yes, uh, John. Um, I, I really love the, the, paper, the paper things every day. Um, how do you determine um, when you choose the letters to the editor? Well, we usually print most of them. Um, oh. Yeah, because um, I kind of feel that most people have the right to say what they want to say, um, and then some are not up to quality. Put it that way. So those don't make it in. Sometimes I'll reach out to say this isn't going to work, um, or you're using language that pe people are going to interpret a certain way. Um, but I, I feel like we run, and then sometimes, sometimes what happens is, is there'll be a, a surge of letters on a topic, and we don't get to all of them, and then we kind of move on from there. Mm -hmm. And so some just get lost; they don't make it in. Um, but it's never like, well, I just don't like this person or anything like that. Um, but sometimes they don't. And, and usually, if um, someone's letter doesn't make it in, they'll they'll reach out and say why didn't they make it in. I'll explain it to them. Um, but and then sometimes they're too long. 
and sometimes they're unco incoherent. You know, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all sort of. <coughs> they usually pretty much, as you said, kind of in a relative time frame of what's going on. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, say, for instance, someone wanted to address, like, um, the balloon, right, the, the balloon that went across the country or something like that. And say we got a bunch of them, and after a couple of weeks, you know, maybe we. Maybe we have moved on from this, maybe we haven't, right? Maybe it's something that, if, by the way, did you want to freshen up your letter? I've done that uh, based on new events. Or someone wanted to talk about the State of the Union or they wanted to talk about, um, you know, Caltrain safety or something like that. So. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Oh, so I'm a digital subscriber, by the way. I love your astronomy section. <laughs> yeah, with Michelle. Yeah. So uh, here's my question. You had mentioned that how you kind of see things going is this kind of fragmentation or a atomization mm -hmm. of specific... We're in the atomization right now. We are in the atomization. Yeah. And so, um, okay. And then do you believe that that further... See, to me, with in the atomization, then you don't have context. Mm -hmm. You could be missing context mm -hmm. and therefore make possibly incorrect knowing, knowingly or unknowingly conclusions and further fragmentation of polarization. Yeah. I know that's a lot of T-I-M, T-I-O-N words, but yeah. do, do you see that as a, as a byproduct of atom, atomization or pros and cons since we're in it? I, I just <coughs> see it out of I mean, missing context. I think there's a lot of positive aspects of the atomization that could come out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm also sort of a, um, a positive person. I, I, I'd like to see, you know, what can we do with, with this, right? Um, but, of course, there's huge amounts of negative um, in that people become siloed, right, in their own sort of sources of information, and they don't, it becomes an us versus them, and, and you're bad, you know, people who live next to each other all of a sudden hate the person next to them because of whatever reason. And I think there's a lot of danger in that. Um, and I think that there's, I don't know it, I don't know if it's my problem necessarily, right? But it's our problem overall as a society and how we engage with each other. And I think that the more people engage with each other online versus in person, I think there's risks that people will become um, radicalized, honestly. Um, and so I've seen that in the last three years, and I think COVID didn't help either. Um, people sort of went down these weird rabbit holes and all of a sudden there are different people. And, um, and the way that we connect and communicate with each other is a little bit different too. Plus, we're in a very high stress area uh, where everyone's sort of uh, fighting for resources or you know, wanting to make sure that we um, either stay the same or, or, or change dramatically. And I think that once you have those types of tensions that it's really difficult. And that's why I was saying that a lot of the stories are no longer about, you know, community-based, but it becomes this sort of like political controversy. So I see it, and I've written about it extensively, about the dangers of this. So, I mean, it's not like, uh, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I am worried about it, yeah. I think we should all be worried about it in every aspect of our lives, yeah. Russ? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the economics of journalism? I, I have three points that maybe you can talk about. One is, you mentioned investigative journalism, and that's an expensive endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the second would be the demise of the editorial cartoonist. <laughs> <laughs> thirdly, would be uh, one time I interviewed Dave Price of the Palo Alto News, and I said, why don't you have an online edition? And he said, because I can't make any money. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to give us some insight about that. Right. Well. well, I think as far as online, he's right. There was a point where, um, So, the people who run newspapers are generally, the industry was such that it was difficult for them to be creative financially because they were making money doing what they were doing for so long. And then everything changes, right? Everything changed, you know? Um, and they didn't quite get on board, and so it was reactive. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why we started charging for online subscriptions was because we weren't making money online. And we were actually losing readers to online, and uh, so people weren't reading it in print as much. Not, not that bad, but a little bit. Um, so when you read it in print, you read the ads, and, and so that's where we get the value from it. On, online, it doesn't make up for that, so that's why we started charging. Um, 
pretty much we're, we're all moving to, uh, I, Dave does have an online uh, presence now, but he only does select stories. So you can't go to the post and go online and read it. So he kind of begrudgingly went that way. But he was always sort of like, oh, you gotta read the paper, you gotta pick up the paper. You know, Dave. Um, um, and then, I'm sorry, you got, yeah. Editorial, oh, editorial cartoonists. You know, we had one once, and, and I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it was too big. Good old days. Economics, right? Economics. 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 Yeah. Charged. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, resources are always a struggle, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, we're we're basically <coughs> focusing on the core. Um, so investigative journalism, we do what we can when we can, um, but. It's gotten more difficult recently because there's more news, there's more cities that we cover, and there's less staff, and the staff is younger and less experienced. So I spend a lot of my time bringing this young staff up to speed, and then um, either they move on or, or um, yeah, usually they move on right at this point. So it would be great if we could keep them because I feel like we could do some good investigative work. Um, but you know, I feel like it, at a certain point there might be I don't know, maybe there's an opportunity for that. Um, I think that there's a lot of things that could be unturned, yeah. for sure. Okay. And it's like one of my, like, uh, it kills me, right? That we can't get to everything. Um, but, uh, and we can't commit the resources to that. Uh, because I feel like I know the community well enough that I, can, I would know where to sort of look. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe we could use one of those AI art generators. Maybe. Yeah. Kind of like generate a cartoon showing this and this in the style of Oliphant or whatever. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Follow up on the economics. The Post seems to have developed this monopoly on real estate ads. Yeah. Full oh. page real estate ads. Yeah. Yeah. Are they giving it away as a sort of a loss leader so realtors can afford it? And why I, aren't you guys <laughs> selling full page ads to these? Right. They, these they sell their ads really cheap. So they do volume, right? So um, I, I don't know if this is the case anymore, but I know at one time like, the full page ad was like 100 or 200 dollars, right? Uh, whereas we, it's probably more now, but um, the the minimum price that we have for a full page is like 1400, um, and so they would just they would just do volume, and they would capture more real. So you get a few real estate, and then the more that you have to, then that's how you sell it. Like you have to be in there. Um, but they used to be like 96 pages at the time, and I think they're down to like 40 or a little bit less. Um, but a lot of it is, is the real estate ads. Um, we have a few, you know, but I mean like, also real estate is you know, up and down. It's been up for so long um, that you don't want to put all your eggs in that one basket necessarily. So um, it's almost like that's their niche in a way. They kind of captured it, and if you're real estate agent, you're like, no, I'm in the post. Because people read it for those ads. You know? Yeah. Um, I know you have guest columnists from the high schools, and I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, do you work to bring up young reporters and steer them towards a career? You know, yeah. Yeah. Other than that, that program. Yeah. So, so the the columns you talk about is student news column, um, right. and so that's once a week, and we have five interns from the different high schools. We have two from Burlingham High School right now. Um, and we usually like to have one or two from Berlin, uh, one or two from Aragon. We don't have any from Aragon right now. Um, usually San Mateo and then also Kalman. Um And so the program is basically they, they do like some like real basic stuff for like data entry. Um, so for, they actually come into your they office? They come into our office like an hour or two. Okay. Like an hour after, hour or two after school, one day a week. Um, and then they, they write the student news column. Um, and so I'll work with them on that. Um, some of them are really good. Yeah, um, they're really good. And uh, I think it's important that people kind of know what they're thinking, right? the, the young generation, so that's been helpful. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, and so we've had a couple of interns who actually return um, while they're in college, and so I'll work with them. Um, I mean, we've had, we've had, let's see, I think every newspaper around here has a daily journal, former daily journal intern. So the Chronicle, the Mercury, all have it. Um, we've had interns go to CNN, uh, Washington Post, Oregonian, um, what else? Um, yeah, so yeah, we do, yeah, I mean, it is a, it's a good sort of training ground for young reporters. Um, 
but also some of our young reporters go into government work too. Uh, you know, we have uh, Michelle at the county, Bill at the county, um, Heather, Heather is in San uh, No, she does. Um, she was. No, she does um, education PR for Larson. Yeah. And there's somebody at. Oh, oh, Samantha, you're thinking Samantha. Samantha. That's yeah, Samantha's in Samantha. 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 Yeah. yeah. So, um, which I, I don't really mind necessarily because they kind of bring a reporter mindset to that position. Yeah. Uh, a PIO position, so they kind of get what we need. And once you're a reporter, you're always kind of a reporter. You kind of, and that sort of like justice thing kind of kicks in. Um, and as far as like knowing what information they convey, they're pretty good at it too. So. Um, as much as I like to keep people, but yeah. you know, sometimes you just move on. But I, I appreciate your starting that younger generation yeah. as yeah. part of your paper. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Mm -hmm. we have self publishing journalism is a dying breed of people who are really journalists. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's bloggers, well, but there's yeah. Yeah. not people yeah. who are trained with the ethical standards of right. being a journalist. There are, there are um, young people who are trained in right. ethical standards. Um, but there's more activist type uh, journalism out there as well. Um, that's not necessarily my style, and, and, um, but I mean, it may end up being the norm. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you uh, pick your editorial writer? Do they get paid? Yeah, um, they do. Um, we, how do we pick them? <laughs> they just kind of show up, I guess, right? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it just varies, right? I, it's from just having relationships over time. Like, oh, I'll give you the last one we picked up was John Morgan, right? Who was work, who was writing for the Mercury because he worked for the County Times, and he's like, he just said, "Can I write for you?" Because no one's reading my stuff. Um, and I said, "Sure." So that was basically how that worked. Uh, Mark Simon used to work for the Chronicle, and I just knew him because he used to work for Caltrain a little bit. And then he said at one point he might be interested. So. Um, and then Greg Wilson, for instance, um, had a blog in Redwood City, and I found his stuff to be kind of interesting, and I asked him if he'd be interested. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just just sort of, that's how, how it works. Yeah. Are you interested? Uh, no, you have, you have one, one who kind of makes me Oh, is it macro? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, we we run him just to make you angry. Yeah, right. oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean it, he's conservative, and a lot of people disagree with what he has to say. But I think he represents a certain portion of our population, mm -hmm. um, and it's important for everyone to kind of know what everyone's thinking. I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you got something? Absolutely. I have a question, a basic question about your circulation area. Before COVID hit, um, newspapers papers were delivered along my street here in Burlingame where a certain number were left in certain build, certain multi uh, unit mm -hmm. buildings. And then that disappeared, so I learned about your online and I subscribed, which is it's working for me. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what is your coverage area for the physical boxes that you have? Yeah. Is it some, just the major cities? I don't even completely, you know, not without going back to newspaper and looking what your coverage area is in terms of being accepted. Right, okay, so we go from Redwood City um, up to South San Francisco and over to the coast. So we have Happen Bay. Those are the areas that we cover. We don't cover Daly City, Pacifica, mm -hmm. East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Woodside, Portola Valley, and then sometimes we cover Hillsboro. Um, but we circulate in all those areas that we do cover. Um, usually in the downtown cores uh, along major transit areas and if people request we can um, go into businesses and multifamily housing we also do home delivery as well but usually there's a charge for that and it also the charge depends on um, how close you are to our natural distribution point so for instance like if you are um, you know six miles away from a box then we would charge more if you were just like around the corner from the box um, but also during covid most of the offices didn't want us to do it, um, to deliver. So we, we um, were able to circulate more into the boxes. Um, but during COVID, like in the heart of COVID, like the first like eight months or so, um, we dropped our circulation by like 7,000, um, from 30,000 to 23,000, and now it's back up to 30,000. And then in that time, though, our online circulation jumped from 6,000 to 12,000. So it was kind of like that's how, so, you went online, a lot of people did that. 
we started out doing it for free, and then after two months of doing it for free, it was basically like, well, you have to start charging. Um, it's like, you know, I mean, during COVID, Charity Joe's like charged for bread, so we had to yeah. charge for it too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like the opinion pieces that you have um, by students, mm -hmm. high school students. Mm -hmm. I think on the weekends. Yes, the weekends. Some of them are very insightful. Some of them are, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's great, and um, I'm always, um, not always, but usually I'm, I'm surprised and um, pleasantly surprised by some of the, um, I guess the intellect that they bring to the, the topic as well, and, and their writing skill. Um, but it's not like they just show up. I mean, I do interview them to make sure that they have that sort of skill set before they intern. Um, and usually they do writing samples in advance to kind of make sure. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great value add. Anything else? I, I have a, uh, well, two. One was sort of answered, but um, do you have sort of this either spoken or non-spoken agreement with the post, like if something happens, I mean, if it's really important, you both cover it, but is there sort of a, in your mind, well, that's kind of their stuff, I won't deal with that, because there's so many things that happen, I was wondering about that. I mean, they're Palo Alto-based, so a lot of their stories are, are not, in our area, um, but we don't have any kind of relationship with them. Uh, I know Dave because I served on the press club with him. Uh -huh. like he's I, he's all right, you know. It kind of grows on you. After a while. <laughs> um, but um, and I, you know, I kind of sometimes I like his style. You know, honestly, like I kind of like how he kind of gets aggressive with certain yeah. things. Um, what does happen sometimes is that if something becomes someone else's story. And so you kind of let them have the story, right? But then sometimes you can't really ignore it. Like, like a, um, an example is um, the Ron Galatola, the, um, the chancellor. So the Post was very aggressive on getting some of that stuff early on. And then this week, we got the exclusive on this lawsuit. And then um, if they had gotten the exclusive on the lawsuit, that would have been on the front page. But then they had it the next day inside. So it's like kind of like, well, we have to cover it. So we'll just kind of... CYA over here, and then they'll probably work very hard to like get us on the next one. So there's a little competition there. So. Well, that's quite a, that is quite a story. So that's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just um, I did want to. I know you probably get zero sleep. I wanted to therefore thank Dean and your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but because I but but it, because you're obsessed, right? So you don't. You don't sleep. Reporters don't, and and um, you have something in your head always, some issue. So I, we, as historians, we, um, well, first the readers obviously appreciate you very much, but um, we just have such a volume of material. I don't do online because I go pick up the thing and clip, and and so uh, we have lots of clippers and we use them, and um, years and years of clippers, years and everybody else's and. Um, so we were just very appreciative for um, thinking of the future of, you know, people who are going to be doing stories of this period that will be historic in some, right. at some period. Yeah. Um, and how appreciative we are of all the work you do and, and your colleagues and your staff. Um, when you're talking about having all these boxes and drop-off areas, how many folks actually are running around delivering like a... How many do you have doing that? They, they, like between 12, 12 and 15. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And they do it. But here's the thing. What, what they do is they do it at the same time. That, so they have four jobs at once. So the same driver who delivers the Post and the Mercury or the New York Times and, and uh, the Chronicle will deliver ours at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they're able to work in three hours and get paid by four or five different companies. Um, that's why, um, well, this is one of the thing, but why Assembly Bill 5 is such an uh, irritant to us. Because yeah. it, it, was, it was done in a way that um, wasn't understanding how our industry works. Um, so if that had gone forward, we had a little bit of a reprieve. We'd have to form a, another company to have those drivers do that job. Mm -hmm. um, whereas right now, they, for the most part, they enjoy that because they can get four or five jobs at once in three hours, and then you could go do other jobs. And that's what a lot of them do. And um, anyway, that's a whole other topic. Um, but yeah, thanks to them yeah. for sticking with me. I appreciate that. Yeah. Of all the stories that you've done, 
What are you most proud of? I should have. I should have known that was going. <laughs> um, I'll say this. I mean, it's, it's not a story, right? So um, it's, it, but it is something that we did, um, and this is kind of like where I see myself in the community overall. Is that there was this um, this guy who stabbed someone on a bus, and he was arrested for it and charged with a crime and sentenced. Um, for the crime, and he would call us and blame us for his inability to find stable housing because we reported on this crime, and he wasn't allowed in certain areas because he had this crime or whatever, and he had a lot of problems, um, and um, he would call us all the time and sort of badger us and, and say, you know, you got to take down the stories from my life, blah blah blah, all this stuff, right? And at one point, he was, he called me, asked for me and was um, off, very off, right? Talking like almost suicidal in a way and talking about, um, um, you know, just things weren't going well. And, you know, I said, listen, um, you gotta call this number. You gotta promise me that you're gonna call this number. And so it was behavioral health, it was a hotline, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, you need help right now and I want you to get help and I want you to call me back once you get the help. Um, and he never called me back. Um, and so I worried about it because I was like, what, you know, whatever happened. And then six months later, I get a call. It's the same guy. He's like, oh, God, this guy. Again. But he actually, he actually thanked me for, I guess, listening to him, right, in that, in, in that moment when he was sort of desperate, not feeling well, and he was able to get stabilized. Um, not that his life is great, but it's better and it's stable, and he's not in that situation at that point. So that wasn't a story that we wrote. But I'm proud that I was able to sort of uh, be open to helping him, even though he was not the nicest guy. And he's been through a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of what we can do, right? Is that you, when you someone calls you in need, like you can help them. That's your integrity. Right, that's, that's you can help someone in need, right? And so that's sort of what I'm proud of. That, that that's just an example, like we get calls like that all the time, and I'm constantly referring to people. People call the newspaper because they're desperate, right? Because they didn't get the help that they need. So we can know we know people, and I can call someone and say you need to help this person, or, or maybe this is the right person um, to to connect with. Maybe they didn't know who to call, um, and that's part of what we do. And for me, that's sort of what I'm proud of. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. What time do you put the paper in bed every night? Because I've noticed even today, often there'll be an AP story that appears in your paper the day before it appears in the Chronicle. <laughs> I don't know if Chronicle still runs multiple editions or not. If there's a Peninsula edition that comes out sooner yeah. than the city edition, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. pretty consistent. Uh, you get the as, a, as a Chronicle subscriber, I'm just going to chat a little bit, right? So um, their deadlines are terrible. And so like, there was a, a, the 49ers were playing at 5 o'clock on Saturday. Yeah. And they didn't get the results in the next day's paper. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. 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 Anyway. That's my, yeah. just as a customer, that's a complaint. Yeah, yeah. Um, do, do I don't know, know what their deadlines are, but our official deadline is midnight. Mm -hmm. um, but usually we go, they call it go to bed. Um, yeah. We put the paper to bed around 10.30 or so. John, do you want a better Chronicle example? Sure. <laughs> they do run a separate edition when you're up in Tahoe. Mm -hmm. And I bought the paper. Um, and it was like two weeks old. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Thursday paper. But it was highlighting what channel the Wednesday Warriors game was going to be at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, if we ever do that, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I want to go back to that. I thought that, that when you were describing your interaction with that homeless person and his, his history, do you believe, if, for example, if I get a ticket, it washes off my, my auto record in three years. Do you believe there's a time where someone's public record should just evaporate? Right. It's the right to be forgotten, right? Right, right. yes, right exactly. Concept. Yeah. That's something that all newspapers right now are sort of contending with, especially with, um, I guess, the reckoning when it comes to um, race and police reporting of the past, right? So. Um, it's something that we're all sort of talking about. Um, 
I think there is an opportunity to sort of let that go. But then on the other hand, our responsibility is to let the people of the community know what happened. In a way, we're sort of erasing something that happened if we erase a story from our website. So it's a, it's a difficult thing, right? People say, um, you know, my life has changed. I wanted to get a job, and someone looked me up, and they found the story, right? Um, you know, is there any way you could do that? Um, and every, every time I get that request, I say, would you be interested in doing a story about how you turned your life around? No one ever does it. Uh, because I think that would be the best way to do it, right? Say well, someone turned their life around. That's that assumes you find it. Right. You know, I, I think you have to look at the value. The, the small amount of people are probably going to find look for that article. And, and when I say people, let's say non-employers mm -hmm. looking for it versus a potential employer. And this person has, what we'll say, paid their dues to society, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how to go to court, possibly, you know, how to work, parole, whatever the, the, but they've got through it and they're mm -hmm. done. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, like I said, it's something that we're thinking uh, yeah, about think, quite I a bit. Yeah, I think it's a very serious. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. There you go. John, years ago, uh, the San Mateo Times had a, a column, a columnist, Karen Keyes, who wrote Talk of the Times, right? Mm -hmm. It's a gossip column. What about the journal? Once a week, gossip column. <laughs> uh, I know that Joe and Russ would love to write it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I kind of feel like Mark, Mark Simon's kind of a political yeah. gossip, right? Yeah. When you get into other gossip, it gets a little dicey, you know? Let's get dicey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take this call? Yes, Mark yeah. 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 No one's names were named, but everybody mm -hmm. knew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well, okay. All right, awesome. think about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, You've been shafted. <laughs> is that it? That was the end You've been shafted. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds yeah. fun. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if there, I don't know what time it is, but are there any more questions for Oh, I, I have one. Piggybacking on the crime mm -hmm. report. You know, for years, maybe, I believe it's your paper, I never saw crime in Hillsboro, and I found that very amusing. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, like murder. were they not letting you into the police reports, or? That's interesting. We used, you know, uh, that's a good question because we used to have Hillsboro police reports. Yeah. And suddenly, some at some point, we stopped. Yeah. There's no crime in Hillsboro. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is. <laughs> um, no, that's good. I'll look into that. Yeah. Yeah, because I know that there's crime laws. Right? There was a gal who murdered her boyfriend. And yeah. 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 I think they're Facebook back to China. The reason we moved to Burlingame was because of the police report. Oh, I thought you were going to say because of the low crime from Hillsborough. <laughs> well, no, because I remember picking up a local paper before we decided to move here, and the big crime that was reported in Burlingame was that somebody was mowing the lawn in Washington Park. <laughs> Oh, that's the big crime. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually, it's so funny you say that because Bobby Benson, who came from Texas, she told me she also read, she picked out the area from the police reports. <laughs> and I think, I don't know, I think some of ours are missing because did you hear uh, Laura Hesselbrin was like assaulted with a car down on, yeah, and Why the dogs, and it, on Clarendon, yeah. I never read about that. Oh, it was a yeah. uh, yeah. with gang, I guess they were gang. Wait, when was it? Uh, a couple weeks ago, or one of our neighbors. <coughs> <coughs> or a dog, yeah. or was I next door? Well, I don't do yeah. next door, so. Oh. Well, I just was surprised one. it was not right. a newspaper. I never saw a police report about it either. Yeah, I didn't see it. But she's yeah. really scared, yeah. and it was very bad. Oh, right. I mean, do you get crime graphics? Just Everything? Do you subscribe to the crime graphics? Why are they going to be on there? Have you heard that story? I was like, where did the story? Well, her name's not going to be there, but if they caught the person, their name's they there. They didn't catch me. Okay. Well, when they do, it'll, it'll pop. Well, that's the thing too. Is, you know, I mean, we can't, we can't know everything. So yeah, it's good if you hear something to just ask us. Yeah. Yeah. That helps too. Mm -hmm. Okay.
so this is right. great and um, really interesting, super topic. Mm -hmm. This no is go on forever. I love it. I for being so generous with your time. Yeah, I know sure. you're so busy. I know we appreciate you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.